Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Summers, the CEO of the Center for Public Justice. We're an independent, Christian, nonpartisan civic education and policy organization. Thank you for joining our webinar, sharing our new research about faith in child care settings. Our agenda for today is simple. Rachel Hope Anderson will share the research findings and opportunities for future work. She'll be joined in discussion by Chelsea Langston Bombino, and then we're gonna to turn to you for your questions. So to help set the frame for our time today, we'd just like to say that we are keenly aware that the child care ecosystem is fragile and needs better support, both to make good care available to families who need it and to make the profession livable for those who provide child care. Rachel will share more about the key questions we were seeking to answer in undertaking this research specifically about faith in child care settings. I do want to acknowledge at the outset with a thank you, the research team from Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion during the research phase. The key findings of the research and our discussion of the future implications of the research are the main focus for our time today. As we go along, because we hope to answer your questions at the end, please go ahead and add any questions you have using the Q&A function, not the chat function, on the lower toolbar during the webinar at any point, and we'll be able to come back to them. So now I'm gonna to turn to Rachel and introduce her and bring her into this conversation. Rachel Hope Anderson is a coalition builder, facilitator, and policy advisor with a background in law, community organizing, and religious studies. Rachel is the founder and senior advisor to CPJ's Families Valued Program, which advances family supportive policies like paid family leave, protections for pregnant women, and a child care ecosystem that meets families' needs. She is also the principal of Hope and Consulting, which helps faith, civic, and philanthropic organizations build common ground. Previously, Rachel held leadership roles at the Center for Responsible Lending, the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts, and the Boston Faith and Justice Network. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you um, to everyone who's joining us today. Um, as Stephanie described, we'll use this time to describe um, the findings and some of the implications of a two-state survey um, that CPJ was able to undertake together with researchers from Baylor um, of childcare providers in Massachusetts and Georgia. I'm gonna start today with um, some background about how faith in childcare settings is currently understood and has been recently researched. Researchers and policymakers commonly focus on faith affiliation or uh, the, the location of childcare in houses of worship. So we know, for example, from the National Survey of Early Care and Education um, that just over 6% of childcare centers report being sponsored by a religious entity. We know from other surveys that about 20% of center-based childcare arrangements are located in a church, synagogue, or other place of worship. And uh, thanks to a survey by the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, there's an understanding that uh, a portion of parents uh, express a preference for faith-affiliated childcare. About 15% of parents um, in that survey said that they preferred a child care center affiliated with a faith organization. But what these, uh, these sources of information um, don't share with us uh, is, uh, is kind of another piece of the child care picture. So we don't know a whole lot about what faith or religious practices occur in child care settings either center or home-based, which also makes up um, a portion of the childcare ecosystem. We don't really know the prevalence of faith or religious practices in childcare settings. And uh, we don't have a lot of information about how providers are incorporating faith or religious practice 
in childcare settings. Um, with what intention, for example, um, are these practices an expression of their personal faith, a part of faith formation um, for children in the community, or responsive to the faith um, practiced by children and their families? Several years ago, uh, the Center for Public Justice, along with partners at Baylor, set out to, to narrow some of these research gaps. Um, we we um, felt there was a need for kind of a clear picture about faith in the childcare setting um, and, and even kind of some methodology that would help us get a little bit closer to the answers to these questions. So uh, the Baylor team distributed surveys um, to authorized childcare providers in, again, two focus states, Georgia and Massachusetts. Um, Providers are both, are both uh, licensed providers and those um, who are authorized in each state uh, and practicing with a, a religious exemption um, from formal licensing. And unlike some of the other previous surveys, this one offered a variety of ways to describe faith involvement, as well as the opportunity to identify uh, specific religious or faith expressive practices. Um, it was a mixed method survey, so we also were able to undertake qualitative interviews um, with a number of providers in both states. So what we found um, kind of helps provide a little bit more of a detail to the picture of faith in childcare. Uh, some of our findings were very consistent with what we see in other studies. Um, in our survey, 17% of childcare was located in religious buildings, um, which is generally consistent with the, with the previous surveys. We were also able to get a little bit of a thumbnail of the predominant religious tradition um, for providers. And these are for both um, family-based and center-based providers. So with Georgia, um, the predominant uh, religion by provider is Protestant Christian with a third of these um, affiliated with the Baptist tradition. Um, we were also able to note that one in four providers were associated with Black Protestant traditions, or you know, the range of traditions associated with Black Protestantism. In Massachusetts, Protestant Christianity, either Baptist, non-denominational, Pentecostal, or mainline, was the largest group, followed more closely um, by Catholic providers. And since we asked about faith in a variety of different ways, we gave a variety of different options for describing faith tradition, we're able to see a little bit more what it means for a provider to be identified with faith. Um, and we found in particular that faith motivation and regular religious practice were more commonly selected as a description by childcare providers than affiliation with a religious institution. So 15% of providers said their program was motivated by faith traditions and values. 9% said their program regularly incorporated religious practices and 6% said their childcare program was affiliated with a faith entity. Um, we we're also able to kind of see, well, how do these self descriptions relate to one another? Um, we can see that uh, that smaller group faith affiliated is somewhat evenly divided between providers who, who only identify as faith affiliated and another segment, slightly larger segment, who are faith affiliated and also say that they're motivated by faith or have regular religious practices. And we can also kind of see here this proportion where a significant amount, about three times more providers indicate that they're faith motivated and or have regular religious practices than are those who are um, identified as faith affiliated. We also uh, asked providers, those who indicated that they had some relationship to faith via affiliation, motivation, or practice about the specific ways in which faith is expressed in their program. Um, and so we see here that the most common ways were incorporating uh, faith or religious practice into daily routines, such as music, stories, or prayer, recognizing religious holidays, applying a values approach 
followed by religious curriculum. This chart indicates all of those practices and we can see here that the least common faith expressions were clergy visits or congregational support. And indeed, we are able to see through this that institutional religious support for childcare was relatively rare. Um, so 5% of childcare centers indicated that they were located in religious buildings and did not pay rent. That doesn't help us see if, uh, if centers have slightly different arrangements such as a subsidy or shared administrative services, but only 5% indicate that they, they were able to utilize the space free of cost. 7% um, indicated that they received some congregational support and 10% who had some faith expression said that they received clergy visits. Because this was a mixed method survey, we had the opportunity to hear directly from uh, providers about their um, relationship to faith and how they would characterize it. Some of this came through in free response questions uh, or free response boxes to questions that were asked in the survey and then some from our um, interviews. And one of the interesting areas that sort of suggests a bit of a lack of fit between um, how questions were phrased and how uh, providers understand themselves was a, a reluctance among some providers to describe their programs as faith-based, despite the fact that maybe even in the intro to this uh, survey or the other research you've seen, we commonly talk about faith-based childcare. So by way of example, here is um, something that a provider shared in the survey. I'm not a faith-based program, but as a woman of faith, I incorporate faith into our day through conversations, blessings during mealtime and any other opportunity that allows faith to be shared. Or another provider who described previously in an interview a fairly deep faith motivation for providing childcare explicitly noted that she didn't understand herself as a faith-based provider and chose not to kind of create her home-based program in such a way because she said, to me, it's hard to do that without discriminating. And so by kind of listening to uh, faith and childcare through the, through the eyes and ears of providers, um, we're hearing that this kind of understanding of describing it, programs as faith-based may or may not be a fit for all, um, all who are in the field. Um, nevertheless, uh, for a significant group of providers, um, this sense that faith uh, plays a role in childcare from motivation to how uh, faith is uh, faith and religious practice occurs during the child care day um, is a significant piece of their work. And these motivations and practice are worth attending to. We found overall about 20% of the sample was either motivated uh, by faith or participated in regular practice. And these uh, uh, providers were just as likely to be family-based as centers. As such, both from the resp uh, survey responses and interviews, providers really shared ways that their own choices cultures and knowledge affects how faith is incorporated into the childcare setting. And this can range from personal faith to rituals and routines that are associated with the home setting and their knowledge of child development and spirituality. One of the providers, for example, shared that she uh, is known to play gospel music during the, the afternoon in her home-based childcare program. Others described the way that just um, the nature of their home would include religious items or symbology that is part of that reflect their personal practice of faith. Um, one of those providers, for example, shared, now that I'm working out of my house, 
the children and their families see obvious signs of my faith. I have a blessing over the door. They'll see a Christmas tree. They'll see an Advent wreath. Providers also shared ways in which um, their knowledge of child development influences their practice of faith. One described, for example, I just think that children are far more imaginative and even spiritual just in their own spontaneous beings than people give them credit for a lot of times. This provider is one whose um, kind of her own spiritual practice is reflected in the home where she provides care. Um, and she sees those objects and books as something that children can choose from um, that they may or may not identify with um, and that can be a springboard for their imagination or spiritual exploration. Um, others expressed uh, a sense of hospitality and really a nuanced approach to holding their own beliefs while also providing care and incorporating a religious practice uh, that reflects the, um, the child and family context of the family that they serve. So in one provider's terms, I can hold my own beliefs while still accepting other people's beliefs and letting them believe what they would like. In more than one interview, we spoke with providers who identified with a particular faith and frequently incorporated practices, um, holidays, and other observances related um, to the families that they serve. And in some instances, expressed a desire for more knowledge and support in, uh, in participating in, in, and carrying out um, religious holidays and other practices uh, that, that match those of the families that they served. In this respect, uh, the providers that operate in such a way um, are kind of drawing on the tradition of the childcare field right now, um, which, which emphasizes um, developmentally appropriate practice that incorporates the cultural, linguistic, and specific abilities that are appropriate for each child in their care. So reflecting on uh, the responses to our survey, as well as the interviews, um, we wanted to propose several distinct but overlapping types that might better describe the ways that faith is expressed in childcare settings. And to be clear, these are not mutually exclusive, but could appear in different combinations. So providers that are, mo that are motivated by the provider's faith traditions or values could, makes up one type. Another that could be uh, together with motivation or distinct is the incorporation of religious practices. And then uh, providers may uh, incorporate those practices in faith responsive ways that are responsive to children's family context and the community. And they may also uh, incorporate those practices and motivation in ways that are faith formative, um, that are intended to introduce children to particular religious traditions and shape their character. And were we to think about these distinct types and begin uh, to uh, or continue to map the child care landscape in more detail. There are lots, of course, of questions to explore. Um, for one, we know that there is some, among some parents, a preference for faith and child care settings. And it'll be worth listening to better understand what is it that parents are, uh, are looking for when they prefer uh, faith in childcare settings, anything from the range of faith motivation to responsiveness to formation for children who attend. Likewise, uh, there's lots of room to better understand the range of providers' goals when incorporating faith in childcare settings, ranging from responsive um, to formative. And then finally, uh, we think these findings kind of lay the foundation for either even further thinking and more kind of granular understanding of the connection between faith and quality of care. Um, we know that quality of care, one of the um, indicators and kind of core ingredients of quality of care is the warmth of relationship between providers and children. 
Um, is there a link then between faith motivation and quality of care? Likewise, faith motivation or religious practice and the well being, emotional, mental, spiritual of providers themselves. And is, is there a link between those um, that faith motivation or practice and quality of care in that respect too? So these are just some of the questions that this initial landscape we think opens up. We're really excited about the opportunity to share it with you um, and to broadly just um, foster a continued conversation about faith in childcare settings and the, and the wide range of ways that parents, providers, and others partner together um, to create healthy settings for children to learn. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Rachel, uh, for sharing that. I'm going to um, turn to Chelsea in a second here for some comments, um, but I do just want to remind you that if you have um, questions uh, for Rachel or for Chelsea as we go along, please do put those in the Q&A um, feature at the bottom of the chat and we'll come back to them um, in a minute. All right, well, let me bring in Chelsea. Chelsea Langston Bombino is a program officer with the Fetzer Institute. Her work as a fellow with the Center for Public Justice has focused on increasing public understanding of the importance of religious freedom for faith-based organizations of diverse faiths and mission areas. Her career has focused on nonprofit policy, democracy, and civic engagement. She's also an experienced facilitator, speaker, and teacher, having led numerous conference sessions and having taught a nonprofit management course at Pepperdine University. She currently serves on the boards of First Amendment Voice and the Young Leaders Institute, and she enjoys spending her free time making yummy vegan food and exploring nature trails with her husband, Josh, and their two children. Chelsea, thanks for being part of the conversation today. We're grateful to have you join us. Um, can you share from your perspective some of the practical implications of this research for faith-based social services, child care providers, and church leaders? Absolutely, Stephanie. Thank you for having me today. Um, I think at the top level for all three groups, this research is so important because it gives us a new perspective. Um, I love to think about big ideas. And one of the big ideas that I'm walking away with here today is that sometimes the term faith-based, which many kind of highly professionalized advocacy type folks in DC use, or um, many in kind of the, um, in certain faith communities use, is often limiting in terms of how child care providers with a diversity of faith expressions can um, think about who they are and the types of spiritual formation or other services they offer children. So I would love to kind of start off with all three groups and encourage a reframe from thinking about those that don't identify necessarily as faith-based as some sort of limiting factor to thinking with curiosity about what types of questions could we ask those who would not necessarily identify or even be averse to the term faith-based, yet still often are participating in the types of practices Rachel discussed today. So everything from daily um, music and stories that may have, be faith-affiliated to being religiously and culturally sensitive, with providing meals, which is also best aligned with a lot of national early childhood standards around cultural sensitivity, to thinking about in-home or family-based um, uh, child care centers and the ways in which those individual um, providers may themselves identify as faith-based and how that might, or faith-affiliated in some way, faith-motivated, faith-sensitive, and how that might affect the types of care they provide. So just that shift from um, someone who's not identifying as faith-based, they must be secular. I think that is a leap that's often made that can actually be harmful and shut down conversation about the ways in which those in the child care um, provider services with many diverse expressions of faith may actually um, deepen our understandings of what that can look like beyond um, can maybe the mental map a lot of us have, which is not necessarily a wrong mental map, but might actually be 
much more limited than the canopy of the field. More specifically, churches. Um, some of this research revealed that not an insignificant amount of churches are often allowing um, uh, child care centers to run from their church rent free. So churches, as have been shown by other and congregations in general, as have been shown by other studies, are often a backbone of communities providing so much value. Um, and so really, if you are a church leader and you have space that's available during the week, a first step might be um, engaging with a formal, so a local state or even national child care association in your area to learn some best practices um, and to see if there are child cares in your area that are seeking a home, if that would be something you all would consider. That could be a really great way of um, helping to advocate for that type of partnership. In addition to, of course, many churches, um, although less, as this study has showed, um, are formally affiliated with the child care and participate in areas like um, clergy involvement or sponsorship. When we think about um, child care centers who do identify as faith affiliated, um, this is a great way. Um, this study showed so much just fascinating results, particularly around family centers and in-home care. Um, and um, there is a emerging uh, network called Homegrown um, that Rachel actually um, has shared with us. And it's just one to watch, but really to not necessarily limit our conceptions of the diverse expressions of faith that exist in child care to center-based care, although that's so important, but to think about um, family-based and in-home care as well, um, and to think about the types of partnerships or collaborations that you could um, even informally have in your community to get to know those providers, ways in which that could um, mutually benefit you both, and also expand our notions of really what the true map of child care in the United States looks like, especially in um, areas where like maybe institutional child care deserts are short. And then when we think about um, the larger um, sector of child care in the U.S. We know so many amazing providers and networks that offer best practices standards often are willing to engage with faith affiliated or um, providers or providers with diverse expressions of faith or spiritual formation. Um, but often, um, you know, sometimes just not knowing can bring about um, assumptions or mis misconceptions. So we really encourage a two-way street there for providers with diverse expressions to be able to um, uh, confidently and humbly at the same time express that actually sometimes their faith orientation can actually serve as a resource to offering culturally sensitive programs to the families they serve. And that actually is a best practice, whether you are a secular child care provider or child care provider with a faith expression. And then vice versa, um, helping providers that serve generally secular audiences think creatively about the ways in which there may be um, ways to collaborate more with those that do um, identify along a faith sensitive or faith affiliated spectrum. Those are just a couple ideas. And I'll turn it back to you, Stephanie. Great. Thank you, Chelsea. That's really helpful. I'm going to bring Rachel back in um, as we kind of loop into our question time so we can have a conversation together. Um, you know, I, I do think, Chelsea, you just highlighted something that I think for us was also a surprising and delightful key finding and an interesting one um, that we thought would be of interest to the community, which, you know, there are a number of providers, both center-based and particularly family-based, who said they're motivated by faith or regularly practicing faith in daily activities and routines in the child care settings in a variety of ways, uh, some of which might be surprising to some who just think about kind of a uh, traditional, you know, kind of like cl clergy coming to visit. Um, you know, faith in child care settings, you know, we would probably suggest is more traditionally understood kind of solely as like faith affiliation, that kind of component. But the study really shows about three times the number of providers who are faith motivated or who integrate faith into their daily activities and routines. So Rachel, you know, I'd, I'd love for you to just say a little bit more for someone who might not understand the importance of this finding or like why it would be important to understand more because the study really in some ways, you know, answers some questions and then has a whole host of additional questions it's asking. Could you just discuss a little bit about why it's important to understand more about faith in child care settings? Sure. Um, 
So I think that, um, again, we, we so often think about uh, faith and childcare as um, sort of a directive that's maybe coming from a larger religious body or a sponsor of some sort. Um, but what can be missed there is um, kind of the everyday practice of the men and women, predominantly women, who are providing care day in and day out. Um, that and that it's that practice that's actually shaping the learning and growing experience for young children. Um, so by kind of paying attention to faith, asking about it in a number of different ways, we really wanted to just um, hear what does that you know find out what does that look like and provide a foundation from which we could think a little bit more um, about how does faith really intersect with the development of children and the quality of care the kids receive. Sorry, trying to manage the chat, the questions and the mute button at the same time. Um, there's a couple questions that people have asked us about particular things in the study. So I'm gonna try and um, draw on a couple of them here. Um, one is, is there a link between faith-based childcare and an increase in social and emotional well-being essential for school readiness? That's the question. Um, so again, I think we're at the beginning of trying to understand that, that very question. I really uh, appreciate um, it being raised here. So I think it would be that, that's kind of the next question. Um, are there practices associated with faith that can contribute um, to social and emotional learning? Um, I think there are some components that we could begin to think about and piece together. Um, a big one is, and I, I, I'm guessing I'll be talking about this a bit more as well as more questions come in, but um, what's understood in the child care field as developmentally appropriate practice um, for young children. Um, and that is usually understood to be um, practices that kind of uh, have an understanding of typical ch child's abilities in the young years in zero to five um, ages, then the particular abilities and context of each child, and then the child care space itself, how that's constructed um, among the learners that are gathered together with their providers and their teachers. Um, and so you can really see how faith could play a role there. It involves an attentiveness to um, spirituality as it occurs in child development, as well as the context of children and their families, the kind of the concepts and practices that they're learning at home, the degree to which those are carried through in the childcare setting could in fact um, be a foundation for social and emotional learning. But that's the kind of work I think uh, is really worth doing. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, there's a couple of other questions here just about um, particular things in the study. So I'm gonna focus on those for a second and then we can go to some of the larger questions. Um, one question was, did the definition of childcare in the study include the word preschool? Uh, it did not. Um, preschool providers who were licensed providers in their states were surveyed. Um, and so the, and the responses came from providers that were um, kind of evenly distributed across infant, toddler, and three to fives. But uh, preschool wasn't specifically identified in the study. Um, and I should also make clear here that both states have some public schools that are participating in providing pre-K programs. And because those are kind of licensed and overseen a little bit differently, those were not part of our list of licensed providers. Great, thank you. Good clarification. Um, another one about the study itself, were there any findings regarding the intersection between faith-based care and quality of care? So again, this would be one of those future areas of research that are worth investigating. We weren't able to, there are a lot of, there's a lot of a uh, wide body of research out there trying to discern what quality care means and what are the components of it. Uh, but it would, it would then take kind of a, a further, um, wave of study to try to link up any of those faith types that I described at the end with the components of quality care and then potentially down the road uh, outcomes for children who participated in those programs. 
Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna shift a little bit um, to questions that are more kind of like macro um, about kind of the ecosystem itself. So one question is about um, kind of the, try, I think trying to understand the context a little bit for some of the questions. So are there limitations on religious activities of providers that receive childcare assistance payments from the government? Um, so a lot of uh, funding for child care comes through the Federal Child Care Development Block Grants Act um, and then flows through states for distribution. Um, and then historically, there are guidelines around how that money can be used in religious settings. Um, and kind of a whole body of work is, <laughs> is out there around um, uh, funds a portion of those funds are designated as kind of parent directed or voucher type funds. Um, and those voucher type funds have the, you know, the greatest lenience with respect to um, with religious practice or sponsorship in the childcare setting. Great, thank you. Um, this I think is a question actually, I'm gonna ask this one, it loops back to something you mentioned about the study itself that can help as we keep going on the more macro questions. Um, you mentioned the word exemption, so exempt providers early on when you were talking about the set of people who were surveyed. Could you just explain what are the exemptions for faith-based providers? Um, each state has its own regulatory system for childcare, and that also applies to um, any inter kind of at the state level intersection between licensing and religious providers. So I just mentioned the federal government with respect to the, 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 the funding flow, but now we're thinking about the states where there's the authority to license um, and to provide exemptions. So across the states, there's kind of an array of approaches. In the two states that we looked at, um, there's fairly limited exemption from licensing that largely applies to childcare programs early ed programs that are associated with kind of a larger religious entity um, in Massachusetts in particular with a parochial school. Um, and so that's kind of a separate group of providers who by virtue of their association with a religious school or religious entity um, get an exemption from the state's childcare licensing rules, but there's still oversight for, um, for their work and still capacity uh, at least in Massachusetts, to receive public subsidy. Um, but in this instance, there are about, there are about 260 of those providers in Massachusetts and uh, just under 80 in Georgia. So it's a relatively small group of the whole. Great. That's really helpful context. Um, the next question asker wants you to know that this was lots of helpful information and framing. So thank you. That was a, a thing that was very helpful for these questions. Um, just what, if anything, did the research uncover about how the providers themselves interact with federal and state funding streams, including things like subsidies? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, we only got a little bit of information about that. We, we were able to ask in the survey um, whether or not providers had one or more um, participant who uh, came with kind of a child subsidy, so, or a, a state subsidy, and about half, in both states, about half of the um, providers with some faith connection were also receiving those subsidies. That's the most we were able to really get from this wave of research. Um, again, there could be other, other, <laughs> other kinds of questions that are asked and other interviews that would be done to learn about that. Um, I will say that CPJ um, and I have been part of, were able to do a previous study in Michigan with some qualitative interviews that were um, that occurred just after um, the pandemic. And there, there was, at a minimum, I can say there was a real gratitude for among providers for the support that was um, flowing to the childcare community and providers in particular through um, American Rescue Act funds. Those are really kind of a lifeline um, to providers. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, one question about the faith motivated programs specifically, um, how did those programs talk about curriculum or staffing when they talked about faith alignment? 
Um, so curriculum and staffing were a little bit less frequently named um, as a specific practice among faith motivated providers um, and really among any of the providers that expressed faith. So it was daily routines, religious holidays, values approach were the much more common across all of the groups with a kind of a, a smaller subset talking about staffing um, and curriculum. Um, so I, give me a minute, I can look at the specific, look at the specific number for you, but um, it wasn't as frequently mentioned as some of the others, I think comes in a, around like 20 to 25% of, of those folks. I think that's right. <laughs> Um, the um, piece here is you shared in one of the slide decks um, the comment where someone talked about um, anti-discrimination and faith. Or, and so the questioner is just saying, I'm very curious how or where else this kind of comment showed up and if it did show up anywhere else or if it was just kind of one, one comment. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it was just one interviewee who really made that connection between the label faith-based and the concern about being um, interpreted as participating in discrimination or bias on the basis of faith. So that's a single, take that as an anecdote. Um, but we did hear several times um, in writing questions and in, in interview responses, um, this general sense of welcome for uh, children in their program and a desire not to be um, discriminating or excluding on the basis of faith. Thank you. Um, this is a question about capacity. Just, you know, the questioner is asking, what what, if anything, did you find that faith-based providers said they needed the most? Was it capacity building? Was it resources? What did we learn? Yeah, that's a great question. But we didn't ask that question, so I can't I can't speak to that in this round. Um, I, you know, maybe we can also include the Michigan research because um, there, like I said, uh, several people named just the the kind of the value of that sort of no questions asked support subsidy that was were being provided um, to childcare providers post-pandemic and during and post-pandemic. So um, the and so again, from a previous research, the challenges that many faith-based or faith-affiliated or practicing providers express are really aligned with the challenges that are expressed in the field as a whole. And those include pay afforded to, to teachers and providers, the sustainability of running a child care program, um, and uh, and kind of the emotional and physical burden of this kind of work, um, which is uh, very needed and also very intense. Yeah, true, good. Um, we have two more questions in the chat and then one more question uh, after that. So if anybody else has a question, now would be a great time to drop your question in um, using that Q&A uh, button at the bottom. Uh, Rachel, out of the organizations that were ones that demonstrated faith practice in some way, how many were not religiously affiliated of, of those? So if you give me a minute, I'll share screen and go back. Yeah. To that. The best way to describe that. Yeah, I think that'd be really helpful. So I'm not... I may not be able to actually advance slides, so give me another second. <laughs> um, so here we can see that um, there were um, in kind of our analyzed surveys, there were 163 that expressed faith motivation, regular religious practices, or faith affiliation. Um, and of those, 135 did not say that they were faith affiliated. So that's the significant majority. Um, so these are, again, there's expressing faith motivation and or regular practice, but not faith affiliated. 
Right, that's helpful. I think that slide's a really helpful one to sort of illustrate where we are. Um, this is more of a macro question just about um, quality of care. Um, so, you know, aside from one of the things you mentioned, I think uh, when you were talking was kind of warmth of relationship. Someone else was just asking, you know, what are other quality, what are other known characteristics of quality care? Yeah, so there's there's a wide range, but I think we're thinking about a number of things um, when it comes to quality of care. Um, so a kind of some of the inputs here, a, a reasonable ratio between childcare provider and children, and one that's appropriate to the age of the child. Obviously, a higher ratio of caregiver to child for children that are much younger. Um, physical environment is really important. So we're talking about the health and safety of the environment, um, access to outdoor space and play space, um, the kind of elements of the environment that foster play, um, exploration, sense of safety. Um, and then we could also look at uh, kind of part, part of that whole teacher-child interaction is um, the, the teacher's experience, their capacity, their knowledge of child development, um, and their ability to, to remain in the field after they've acquired that knowledge. So looking at teacher retention is also probably something that we want to think about um, when we're looking at quality of care. Great, thank you. Um, someone took me up on the offer for drop their question then in the chat. Um, are there any initiatives in Massachusetts or Georgia that are aimed at connecting faith programs for the purposes of information sharing, sharing research, community building, best practices, et cetera, that were discovered as part of the study? Uh, not, none that we came across in this particular study, but that would be a really interesting question. And, and if you or others who are part of this webinar are connected to that, um, we'd love to know. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, and then I think my last question, um, and you know, Chelsea, feel free to jump in here on this one because this is broader than just the study itself. It's actually focusing to the findings too. Um, you know, the study is able to highlight some of the ways the terminology of researchers might actually need to shift when looking at faith in childcare settings, right? So shift maybe from just faith-based, which seems to collapse a whole bunch of categories under one banner, where you kind of suggested that there's a set of terminology that's not mutually exclusive, um, but ones that maybe amplify kind of important areas of texture or differentiation that are currently too flat when sort of viewed more uniformly. Could you talk a bit about why each of those terms that you proposed are important ones to consider? Um, because I think, you know, you, you laid out four, I think, on that slide, and each of them seems to have a particular value. So I'd just love to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. So, and Chelsea, please join in here too. Um, but I think we were uh, suggesting thinking about faith motivation, faith practice, um, responsiveness, and formation. And um, they all have a kind of a different role or can have different roles in a number of questions that are important to the child care field. So one, of course, is quality of care. Um, and each of those may have a different relationship to quality of care with motivation, potentially affecting how teachers engage with students or their um, sustainability and their mental health and well-being. Um, as, and then practice kind of shapes the child care day, um, what happens in the child care setting. Um, and it can, it can revolve around spiritual concepts, but it can also revolve around stories or practices or even ways of um, thinking about time, um, kind of the seasons of the year. You know, there's in Jewish tradition, Sukkot, where uh, a particular time of the year is recognized in a, in a certain way, um, or other, uh, you know, New Year's and other kinds of celebrations. So practices may affect just how uh, child care gets done. Um, and then, of course, the intention questions, the responsiveness and formation, um, at a minimum, are very important for families, I think, to understand how our providers um, approaching their role in the child care setting and their role re relative to the development of children. Um, and that's one of the areas where um, parents need to find 
the kind of provider that's a, a fit for their values and intentions um, and need to understand what's going on. So those are just some of the examples of why kind of these varied ways of understanding faith and religion um, could be helpful to the field. Great, thank you. Chelsea, did you wanna jump in there? I just think this is so helpful. And if you're a provider, I think you have laid out a framework that might be really intuitive for people, Rachel, that I, I don't think, I, that I did not know existed before. And then for those of us, maybe with my background on this call, who may be approaching this from a um, faith-based advocacy perspective, religious freedom perspective, or kind of faith-based nonprofit perspective, it's often that we're thinking about how do we make sure those with the most kind of um, integrated or from hiring to these practices are included. And that that is, it's so important. Um, but because in some of these other instances, questions around hiring might, or staffing might not come up or questions around family inclusion might not come up. This doesn't mean that these questions aren't really important to understand. And that I know at least I have shorthanded faith-based for do they have, does a religious organization have um, religiously covenantal conduct-based hiring practices? And that's important, but that is not the totality of what it means for a provider to have diverse faith expressions. So I just hope those of us like me on the call walking away really think about um, the nuances that exist around motivation and practice and these other categories you have laid out that often I think can get lumped together into a kind of faith-based services bucket if you're just thinking about what the law allows rather than as this call has focused on largely quality of care, which is such an important thing for us to consider. Right. And I have one final question for us. How will the research inform the field and what do we hope to achieve as a result? I'll just provide um, the kind of the closing thought that is on my mind after reflecting on this, which is um, that we have a whole lot more to learn and to ask both from uh, families and also from providers. So I think there's a kind of a wide open field of um, inquiry and curiosity about what parents hope for um, when they partner with a child care provider um, in the, for the care of their children and what child care providers in their, um, just the wealth of experience and the knowledge that they have of working with children, what they have to offer um, in shaping a, a kind of a future in the field that really is, um, supportive of all children's growth. Great, thank you. And thanks, um, Chelsea, as well, for joining. Really grateful for both of you and your kind of presentation uh, and reflections. Um, you're gonna receive, if you joined us today, you'll receive a follow-up email with the research summary brief. And it will also have a link to the full report, uh, which is more extended uh, on the website. If you'd like to see a lot more about the data and you enjoy the charts, um, there will be that there for you as well, as well as a video of this webinar. Please share it with others in the field who you know are interested in better understanding faith in child care settings. We hope this is the beginning of a conversation uh, that continues forward, um, not the ending of a conversation because we put out a study. Um, and finally, to all of you who've joined us today, thank you for being here um, and for your great questions. And we will look forward to continuing that conversation. All right. Thank you very much.